Okay, so here's the question. The question is, for Piaget, he says, look, intelligence is thinking better. Therefore, from the point of view of an educator, the purpose of education needs to be to make people think better, not to learn more. If you want to get people more intelligent, don't stuff them full of facts. Give them the ability to think and reason. Okay? And be patient. Remember, one of the objections that Piagetians have to IQ tests is that everything's by chronological age. No, that's not right. If you want to know about development, you have to... So the question becomes then, what do we do? What are the mechanisms in the environment that cause us to change the way we think, to think better, to think on a higher level? And here they are. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Here they are. Okay? Don't ignore that side. Here they are. The physical environment. Intera the phys this is what he calls physical environment, social interaction, maturation, and equilibration. Okay, so we're going to need... These are the four, come back to me for a second if you can. I'm doing this, I'm in it to kill time because uh, I lost an arrow here. These are, oops, there we go. These are the four things that will cause us, the four mechanisms that will cause thinking to change. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so let's take them one at a time. Here they are, okay. By the environment, he means interaction with the physical environment. Okay? For pre-operational children, this includes hands-on activity. I don't know who said this, but play is a child's work. Okay? In order to know how the environment works, you need to interact with it. Come back to me. If you go to a Piagetian, we have at the University of Houston what's called the lab school, run on Piagetian principles. And if you go there, you will see Piaget's principles in action. The first thing is the kids are active. Okay? They're exploring. They're not memorizing anything. Okay? And the key to the education is problems, either problems presented by the teacher or problems that rise out of a natural situation and then discussing the problems. Okay, so one favorite problem that they have is they have a, a pendulum, you know, a long rope with a beanbag at the bottom, you know, suspended from the ceiling on a hook. And they give the kids um, you know, bowling pins, plastic bowling pins. And they say to the kid, here are eight pins. How can you get them all to knock down, knock them all down? It's a tough problem, by the way. If you put them in a circle around, how, how get the most knocked down on one swing? Put them together, put them apart, this and that. You see three yards doing it, it's random. And they keep it up in every class trying to solve the problems. How can you do this? How can you do that? Rolling balls down hills, playing with water, playing with this, interacting, interacting, interacting. Problems to solve exploring. And if the kid goes off and gets interested in something, let the kid go. Let the kid's own exploration go. There was once, anybody, was anybody subjected to Madeline Hunter's approach? Let her sue me if she doesn't like what I'm going to say. Which is on task behavior. Uh, who's been, who's had to do that? Uh, Madeline Hunter stuff. How do you know about it? The, the push it down, push it down. It's a sequence of lesson plans. Right. right. And the kid has to be on task, right? on task. I once saw a demonstration, what you do with Madeline Hunter's stuff, how to get kids back on task. There's a demonstration video or film or something. The kid is there and you say, okay, we're studying about rocks, we're studying igneous rocks. Anybody know what igneous rocks are? Volcanic rocks. Okay, volcanic rocks. So the teacher is explaining what the rocks are, and also the teacher says, granite, she shows a piece of granite, and granite is an igneous rock, right? It's formed from, you know, lava drying up. So one little girl goes, oh, oh, I was on a vacation, and we saw igneous rock, and I saw a piece of granite, and the answer is, that's very nice, Sally. 
But that's what we're talking about. Let's get back to the lesson plan. I had a teacher who understood this better. Here, let's go back to the uh, overhead here. Okay. This is more or less a map of New York State. Whoops. Not yet. No, there we go. Okay, there's New York State. And then here's Long Island. This is New York City. Forget about it. Okay? That's New York State. This is like Ontario over here. This is like Erie over here. There's the Niagara River, Niagara Falls. And all, except for the Mohawk River, which runs right here. Wait a second. It's a river, right? The Mohawk River, which runs right here. This is all appears to be mountains. All this appears to be mountains. These are the Catskills. Whoops. These are the Catskills, right? And these are the Adirondacks. Okay? So we're in class, right here. This is Rochester, where I grew up. And we're talking about how these are not really the same. This is an eroded plateau with gentle rolling hills, and these are true volcanic mountains. Okay, and as we're talking, come back to me for a second, okay, as we're talking, we're talking about the rot. Some of us had been, I, I used to go to the Cascos, at least drive through, we'd stay there once in a while, and some kids went to the Adirondacks. And all of a sudden, one kid said, hey, yeah, this was ninth grade, right, it's not fourth grade. I found granite in the Adirondacks. And I remember a couple of us said, yeah, there's no granite there, we found sedimentary rocks. You don't find those too much, right? Rocks that from, because what happened to the Catskills, it was a plain, and then it eroded over the years from rivers and stuff running through it. And, and it was clear from our own experiences that this could not be the same mountain range because of the rocks. And the teacher didn't ask us. One kid said, oh, yeah, I found granite in the Adirondacks. I said, well, that's what we're talking about. Creativity, working together, thinking it through together. Kids ought to have a lot to do because they'll be able to create stuff. Okay, once I saw a project in a, pre in a preschool, the kids were making beehives. And the beehives was brown paper with brown circles on it. So I made three brown circles, one had four brown circles, one had six brown circles, one had five brown circles. You know very well the kids were told what to do. No. Let the kids create. Now this is not, okay kids, this is school, go do what you want and I'll collect my paycheck and see you tomorrow. There are parameters, it's what they often call democratic teaching. There's another word for it they use these days, right? Uh, uh, facilitative teaching. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? If you have a different idea of how to make a beehive, do it. Okay? And try to discover things. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay? That's it. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. And for concrete operational, form operational individuals, this can conclude both hands-on and mind-on activities. That's how I make excuses for just talking to you guys all the time, okay? Hands-on and mind-on activities. Now, so kids need to interact with their environment. Come back to me. They do not see, need to sit there and rote drill lessons, right? I saw an article, I just, I know we're behind, I can't help it, about Drilling for the teams to toss test, now the new test attacks, tacky test, whatever they call it, right? If you see a question about the civil rights movement, put down Martin Luther King, that's the answer. If you see a question about the, about the Revolutionary War, it's either George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, right? They have a couple of code words for each. That's not understanding, getting all the right answers, right? That's not really understanding. I had an experience, I just, it, it, it was years ago when the team's test first came out, or maybe it was the end of the TOS test. It was years ago. I mean, when the TOS test first came out, or the end of the team's test, as we get new test. person comes up to me and said, well, Dr. Lieberman, you said this and this and this and this in class. And the other professor said this and this and this in class. I said, well, she and I disagree. I knew we did, right, about something. She said, but you said it's this. I, she was a classic learning theorist. And, he, she said, it's this. I said, well, that's how it is. We disagree. 
And the student looks at me, she says, but, but, but there has to be a right answer. No, there doesn't. History is not memorizing dates and facts. History is understanding historical movements, how things work. Look, I once, my wife once gave me an eighth grade history test. <laughs> That's how I did on it. I couldn't remember. It was inventors or something. I couldn't remember stuff. But I know history better than those kids. I understand the process. When people say, is this a Hamiltonian or a Jeffersonian approach? What's happened here? What's going on? Historical movements, etc., etc. It's clear to me. People my age realize Kerry is a Catholic and nobody says a word. This is being taped before the election for people who want to know. Nobody says a word. I remember when Kennedy ran. Holy mackerel. He went from in front of a group of ministers and explaining how he wasn't going to do what the Pope told him. I mean, it was from today's perspective, it's silly. Things have changed. You see historical movement, the nature of religion, the force of religion, the force of America seeing itself as a Protestant bulwark. Has it changed? What's going on, on and on? This fundamentalist Protestantism that's making such an impact in America today, it's nothing new. It was one of the driving forces behind the, uh, behind the uh, uh, abolitionist movement. Okay? It comes and goes, but it's there. Hist history is process. It's thinking. To this day, there are brutal debates over the causes of the Civil War. Etc., etc. The arguments over what to do in Iraq now are historical arguments in historical context about the nature and the role of America in the world. And they, Washington was having those battles with, with, other, with, you know, with other people in his, in, in his government. Certainly Roosevelt... And, and, the, and the Republicans before the World War II, after World War II, everybody said, we've got to go and, you know, we just got bombed, we better go do something. There were tremendous debates, and this is its process, its thinking. Science is not memorizing a bunch of facts. What's the smallest horse? I still remember Eohippus, because we had to memorize that over and over and over in 10th grade. I don't know how I remember those silly things. It's the nature of science and the scientific method and what it means, how do we know things and theories. Math isn't memorizing math facts. Hey, what do I do here? Plus, take away times a gazinta. That's a person who doesn't understand. Literature is not memorizing what's on, memorizing what's on page 19 of the Red Badge of Courage. It's understanding power and movement. The best English teacher I know, that's my wife, of course. She has to be the best, right? She takes the kids, read two different books. She said, I want you to take two characters and compare them. Find similarities and differences. You pick them, one from each book. Thinking, creating. That's what intelligence is. When you pick a goal, this is what kids have to learn. You're saying, I don't want creative thought. Nobody ever, ever showed Beethoven how to do music. Because he figured it out himself. He made something new. Nobody ever said, oh, these are your goals to Picasso. Because he figured out things new, cubism and the other stuff, all the other stuff he did, right? When you're telling a kid what the kid has to learn, you're saying, I don't want you to create. I don't want you to think things through. I don't want you to come up with original thoughts. And it goes on all the time. I, my son calls me up. My son says, he's the, I told you my son won an Emmy, right? <laughs> That one. He said, oh, man. He says, I'm either the worst professional guitarist or the, uh, he said, I'm at the, or the best amateur guitarist there is. He, he plays a guitar, he plays a lot. He said, I'm no professional, but he's good. He gets a book from James, Ta about James Taylor's songs, James Taylor's fingering of all the chords. He said, oh, man, am I going to get that. There are 52 different ways, I don't know if it's that many, but there are a lot of different ways to finger a C and a D and a, on, a, on, a, on a guitar. A lot of different ways to do it. And they all give you slightly different sounds. And he said, finally, I see the fingerings. He just, he, there's, a, there's something to it, there's a creativity to it. Why he plays the C this way instead of that way. There was one C and he said he played it the weirdest way. But it gave you that, that melodic sound that he wanted. He thinks it through. It's not, oh, here's a C and here's a D and here's, 50, here's 15 different ways to make a C and here's 12. And ultimately, 
right? Once you get good, you can figure out yourself how to make another C because there's a process to it, an understanding to it. And you can play with it and see which one sound they sound sounds slightly different. I can't tell. But he can because he understands. Yeah. All right. So these are the kinds of things that Piaget is talking about. And he says, oh, nuts. And he says, it's not just you by yourself. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. There's something called, I call it social interaction. It's interaction with the reasoning of the others. Actually, he calls it, or the, the translators call it social transmission. But by social transmission, I change the social interaction for, because he does not not mean passing on the cultural norms or community values. He means, rather, it refers to developing reasoning by interacting with the reasoning of others. So your environment is not only your physical environment. Come back to me if you can. It's interacting with your social environment. For instance, I was telling you in, this, in, this pre, in, the, uh, in the lab school, which is a precast, so the kids go up, I, th I think it goes up to age five, two to five. There are no rules at the beginning. No rules. You know how you go into the, these are the class rules that you have to set up. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do that. No, no rules. The kids play. When a problem comes up, they discuss it. So I, the, I know the person who was, not the director, but she was the fact, she was at that time the faculty liaison. She was the sort of the, one of the key people involved with the school. She said, we had a kid who would bite. Bite. You don't want kids to bite. Okay. She said, okay, let's sit down and discuss it. Let's have a social interaction. How should we bite? You know, how should we bite and when should we bite? When is biting okay? Of course, never. What are we going to do about biting? What's the rule about it? Now, and through it, they developed a rule of biting, about biting, which is you don't bite other people. And even if you're angry, you don't bite other people. If you're frozen. And then it became the kid who bit, I don't know, let's say his name is Fred. Okay, that's Fred's rule. And they write out the rules. Of course, kids can't read, but they write it out and it's hung up there. By the way, some of them can read. I was shocked at some of the words they can read by going over. Fred goes and looks at his rule, right? And they, yes, what does it say, etc. It comes out of the natural idea. And, the, and they have a rule against biting now. When it's kind of kid bites, hey, you got to talk to Fred, it's Fred's rule. And they talk about it again, there's no biting, right? Rather than make the list of rules, right? Societal rules don't come out of somebody sitting and writing them down. They come out of interactions, and we change them all the time, and we fight about them, we have elections about them. Well, when we get to Kohlberg, you'll see that. It's interacting with the reasoning of others. Now, I'm going to tell you a story, okay? And what, basically what happens is that what Piaget says is that when, you, when there's a problem and your reasoning doesn't handle it too well, when you hear the reasoning of others, it helps you go to the next stage. And it's not a matter of reinforcement. Once you go to the next stage, lower reasoning sounds ridiculous. I'll tell you a story. I was practicing for my master's thesis, right? This is the best anti-reinforcement, anti-role social modeling I ever saw, a story I ever saw. And so I'm practicing doing Piaget and stuff, and I was in a... So they let me do it in a kibbutz. It was a, at that time, a, there aren't too many left. It's still, but it was a collective settlement in Israel. They're kind of the, some of the inventors of daycare. The kids would be in, in daycare during the day, and the parents would go off to work, right? And they, so they had these kids, two different age groups in an old chicken coop. Don't worry, it wasn't for chickens anymore. They remodeled it, and they made it nice, made a lovely building. With one of the, but it was a long building, like a chicken coop. You don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Chicken coops are long buildings, okay? So one end of the chicken coop, I mean, you couldn't tell it was a chicken coop unless you were outside or knew, is, is one age group, one is in there. So I'm with the younger kids, and I'm practicing Piaget task with them. And one task you do is called a conservation task. We'll get to that. It's a task, you take, like you take two balls, and the kid holds them, I'm going to say the real kids. He held them in his hand, and he told me they weighed the same. Okay, then I mashed one onto a pancake, and he told me they, the ball weighed more because it's fatter. But in this case, he held them in his hand, two, you know, they're Play-Doh balls, and they weigh the same. Then I took, and I'm, I've been doing this, right, all kinds of tests, pouring water and pushing stuff around. We'll get to that when we get to the stages. And I pushed my finger through one ball. I just 
pushed my finger through it, and the clay that came through, I wrapped around the sides. I said, what did I make? He said, oh, now you got it. I said, what do I have now? He said, oh, now you have a ring. So I said, does the ball weigh more, or does the ring weigh more? Or, are they still, or do they still weigh the same? Or do they weigh the same? He said, the ball weighs more. Right? You just told me the two balls weigh the same. I said, how do you know? Reasoning. How do you know? He said to me, well, the ball of solid ring has a hole in it. All of a sudden, I'm sitting here like this, and over in the corner, I hear <laughs> these noises. I turned around, it's his older sister, who was on the other side, and she'd walked along the wall to see what was happening. I said, what's the matter? She said, wrong. I said, what do you think? She said, they weigh the same. I said, how do you figure? She said, I got a reasoning, or reasoning. She said, you didn't add any, you didn't take any away. You just push the clay around the edge of the hole. It's all the clay still there. It has to weigh the same. I said to him, what do you think? Okay. He thinks about it. He thinks about it. He said, he was ready to move. Okay. He was ready. It made a certain amount of sense to him. If he had been four, I think he was seven and she was nine or eight and ten. Eight and ten, I think. Seven and nine, something like that. Because about he was giving me concrete operational reasoning for others. He was saying, oh, yeah, if you pour water, it's the same. He said, no, I don't think so. It weighs more. Meanwhile, I told the kids to stay away, right? One at a time. But this time, they were all there, right? So I said to her, I said to her, well, why do you think that he thinks that they weigh, that one weighs more? And I wanted to see if she could get her mind around younger reasoning. She said, it's her brother, remember? She said, because he's an idiot. Right? It's her brother. What she goes to her younger brother? What do you think she's going to say? Meanwhile, I, all the other kids, this was interaction was new and different. and everything. All the other kids from his age grew up there. I think there were eight of them. So I said to him, let's see what other people think. So I said, what do you think? First kid, he says, the ball weighs more. The ball weighs more. And her face gets like this. She's looking. Nine kids, eight or nine kids are telling her. Oh. I said, look at How can it be? All of them think the ball weighs more, and only you think they're the same. And what was her answer? Say it. They're all idiots. I said, they're all idiots. And she turned around and stopped on the other side of the room. She wouldn't have anything to do with it. I'm back to her own age group. Now, we haven't talked about conservation yet, but this is all the modeling all the modeling, all the reinforcement, the social reinforcement, none of it made any difference. Okay? But what's happening is she was interacting with other people and hearing what they had to say. Did you ever talking to somebody and say, oh, now I get it. That's what you're talking about. That can happen on your own. That can happen talking or hearing other people talk. Every once in a while I listen to these news programs where people are talking. Mostly it's, you know, political spin and... Uh, once in a while, there's an issue. I said, oh, now I have a new insight into it. By hearing people discussing it. Now I understand something about it. It's even worse than I thought, usually, right? <laughs> so, so, what does it say? If you're, if you're not confused, upset, and depressed, you don't understand the problem, right? <laughs> it's, it's a, if, or if you, think, if you think, right, think everything's okay, you don't understand the problem, that kind of thing. But it's, in the end... Working with it, so Piaget, most people paint Piaget as very, it's different from Vygotsky in that Vygotsky is pushing, remember we talked about Vygotsky, didn't we here? Yeah, remember? Group, cooperation, all that. Piaget is not. That is absolutely not true. Fundamentally and emphatically not true. Matter of fact, the person who founded this lab school, Rita de Vries, who is one of the great Piaget educators ever, one of her criticisms of like Montessori schools, for instance, is that, I don't know if it's true or not, is the kids, there's, it's too much lockstep. There's not, in Piaget too, there's not enough interaction among the kids. Now, I don't want to get into the fight with Piaget Montessori, you obviously know who I'm going to side with, Piaget. But for, for her, the idea is kids have to, everything has to be interacting, working together, planning together, groups working together, people explaining things to each other. Now, group work is not very easy. For instance, I know someone, the second best English teacher I know, right, <laughs> who said she wanted kids to get together and, and listen and critique other kids' work. Listen, think about it in writing. She was an English teacher writing. So the first comment she got was, hey, that sucked. 
<laughs> she had to teach them how to do it. But in the end, they're listening, they're practicing. You could have used more ver more adjectives. You overrode, you this and that. You didn't explain this, you didn't explain that. that, that, that. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. By the way, somebody came in and said, your kids are not doing what she wanted. There's no on-task behavior. So what are you talking about? She said, kids are just sitting there listening. That's not on-task behavior. Thinking is not on-task behavior. Gotta behave, behave, do something. <laughs> And she, and she said, ultimately, it didn't take her too long before the kids began to trust in her. And, you know, and, and before it was not threatening anymore. Let's see what's going on. What do you think? So, I learned from listening to you, to your story, and you learned from listening to what I'm saying about your story. And the third person is learning by hearing this interaction between the two of us. Piaget is adamant about this kind of thing. People need to work in groups to cooperate, to work together. Piagetians are very pro this cooperative kind of education thing, doing things, etc. It's important, not sitting in skills drilling. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Equilibration. Okay, this is a tough one. This is establishing a new intellectual equilibrium at a higher, more adaptive level. Okay? Come back to me for a second. Come back to me. Okay. Here, let me draw this diagram for you. Okay, we have here, let's go to above here, we have adaptation. And we have assimilation, right? And accommodation. And under, so this is a process. This is a sub-process of assimilation. We have the fourth thing. And equilibration, which is the third thing I have under here, it's a sub-process of accommodation. Okay, now I'm going to say something. Come back to me. I'm going to say something that if, I, I hope no, nobody watches this who's a, a, a Piagetian. Or, it's more or less like, it's more or less kind of, sort of, like your endocrine system. What do we call that? Your secretion, right? It keeps things in balance. Okay? The question becomes, once you realize, once you realize that your reasoning is not good, what happens? Uh, uh, my professor once showed me this when I was a, um, a brand new graduate student, right? He made a film of two kids. He said to the kid, what happens when the moon is over your shoulder, I'm gonna walk now, okay? And you walk down the street. The kid said, oh, the moon follows you. The kid says, what happens if you're standing here watching your friend and your friend walks down the street this way? He said, oh, the moon follows her, right? So then he says to one kid, what happens if you walk this way and your friend walks this way. The kid was, I think, four. Because it follows us both. So you're walking this way, and the moon's following you that way. And your friend's walking that way, and the moon's following her that way, right? You say, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But then he had a six or a, a seven-year-old who said, friend, he said, you're walking this way, and the moon's following you this way? And your friend's walking that way? And the kid said, that can't be, can it? The moon can't be going both ways at the same time. This kid is, is what we call, he's ready to move. He was ready to move. Okay. I can see the kid's face. He's like this. He's kind of looking at it. And he, he, I know it's a she day, but it was a, a he on the film. I'm not going to do about it, right? He was ready to move. And he said, hmm. I don't know. Now the question comes, what happens to keep you from just sort of collapsing? And Piaget says this equilibration is kind of a mechanism that helps you, that causes you to reorganize. I'm going to go sit down again. On a higher level. It causes you to reorganize on a newer, higher level. Okay? Let's go back to the PowerPoint now. It's kind of like a driver mechanism that causes the individual 
to make a more adaptive, to be more adaptive. Okay? It's the internal process that causes us to establish a new e equilibrium at the more adaptive stage. We'll talk about that more when we get to stages, okay? What the heck is that? Okay. Let me just say, come, let me just say that the key to Piaget is this discontinuous development, a key. It's not just adding more and adding more and adding more and adding more. It's fundamental qualitative changes. So how come the kid doesn't go to bed, you know, pre-operational on Tuesday and get up Wednesday morning is fully, or by Thursday is fully concrete operational? He says it happens in different domains, in different areas. Those are schemes. We'll get there. We talk about the stages. So we'll get there. But this equilibration ultimately says that little by little, that no that there is a fundamental reorganization, but it happens only in one domain at a time. So for instance, you can get a kid who will tell you, oh yeah, if you uh, take pennies, push them apart, spread them together, pile them up, it's the same number. If you pour water in a tube, oh, if the tube makes the water go higher, there's more water. You'll get kids who will tell you, the pennies are the same. And then we'll say, oh yeah. He, even though he's my son, he's older. Then another kid will say, what are you talking about? If you're the father, you have to be older. But all of you, but the pennies apart, there's more. And Piaget said this has to do with the kind of interactions you have in your environment. How you're interacting, what you're doing. Okay? And so first it'll happen, for instance, pennies is what he calls discontinuous quantity. Some people call it numbers. One, two, three, four, five. Water pouring is a continuous quantity. The weight, length, okay, causality. You take little kids. Why do the clouds move through the sky? Oh, because they want to. Who's ever had a little kid bump into the door, pick up the kid, and the kid just goes, bad door! Whoever did that with your kid, don't lie to me. Whoever did that? Did you ever do it? Of course you do that. What are you, nuts? Of course you do that. Bad door! Kid thinks, well, if I can hit the door, the door can hit me. The door really did it to me. Before you laugh, Heinz Werner talks about under severe stress going to lower stages. How many people have ever stubbed your toe on a couch and wanted to smash the couch to beat your pressure reaction? <laughs> right? Or banged your head on an open door and smashed the door, right? An open cabinet door. I did that with you. God damn it, smack the door! What are you, an idiot? You think the door did it to you or the couch did it to you? What are you, an infant? But under stress, this primitive reasoning comes back. Because he really used to think that way. Okay? So Piaget says there's this natural internal process of part of the positive accommodation is to become more adaptive, to move higher and higher, to have better, better ways of thinking. Okay? And then let's do the last one here. Maturation of the brain. Come back to me. Look at look at me. Look at me. See how how, how dog-eared I am, Harlan. Piaget stages are not maturational. Maturation is one small process, one small mechanism among the others. But Piaget was a biologist, and he knew there was maturation of the brain. Look, let me tell you something, my friends. The brain is an extremely complex organ. Extremely complex. I don't know anything about it. All I know about it is that it's enormously complex. It works with setting up neural pathways that are, and it's, and people, it's very hard. Of course, you ever have a right brain, left brain? There's an old Scottish folk song. You take the right brain and I'll take the left brain. And I'll get my doctorate before ye, right? Now, come on, will ya? Our, both sides of our brains are always interacting. Oh, people say, look, woo, the right side of the brain lights up when you hear music, and the left side of the brain lights up when you do math equations. What a bunch of hooey. How much math is there in music? Who plays a musical instrument? Who plays one? Raise your hand, you'll play one. Who else plays? What do you play? Viola. Viola. Is there math in it? 
circles of fifths, you have to do all that stuff. And what's the ring between the notes and this and that, and sharps and flats and all that stuff. It's extremely mathematical. Matter of fact, the one musical instrument I can play is an auto harp. Just push the button, zing a C, zing a D. I don't have to remember that the key of F has a B flat instead of a B, because there's a B flat on there instead of a B, zing, right? A mathematician showed me how to transpose from one key to another. Right? He showed me the mathematical formula. It's one, four, fifth to the seventh. So the key of C is C, D, E, F, C, F, G, seventh. Right? The key of F, F, G, A, B, F, C, B to the seventh. But it's B flat to the seventh, but that's all right because it's a B flat on the auto harp, right? He just showed me mathematically how to do it. Right? Nothing to it. But it's mathematical. I mean, there's a ton of and, 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 and there's no, in math, right? In, in math, there's no sense of the aesthetic, of the beauty of how things fall into place and how wonderful the, Right? Now, when I first heard it, when I finally figured out what pi was, I said, man, isn't that amazing? We talked about pi, right? Isn't that amazing? A circle with a circumference of a billion miles and the surface a circumference of a billionth of an inch? Circumference over diameter equals pi. There's something aesthetically beautiful about that. I can't explain it. When Beltron made that catch, I don't care if it dates it. I saw a triple play once in my life in a minor league game. Nobody said, Whoo, skillful, skillful. Everybody said, beautiful. What a beautiful catch. What a beautiful play. Because even though it's rich skills, knowing how to do and what to do and throwing the ball, there's a beauty to it. Beltran's catch, fifth game of the, of the, of the National League playoff. I don't know if we're going to win or lose, but man, what a catch. Beautiful. So everything interacts all together, and the brain is extraordinarily complex. I'll give you an example. There's something called the small damage anom anomaly. If you get damage to the left, a small damage to the left side of your brain, and your right hand stops working, forget about it. You'll, you're never going to recover completely, almost for sure. It's very difficult to recover. Let's say you have three fingers that go out, and you can't really make a fist or all that, right? Apparently, if the whole left side of your brain is smashed in, lose the whole thing, you can recover. I had one guy, he lost the whole right side of his brain when he was 15. He kept the frontal lobe, but all the rest was gone. He said, I was paralyzed completely. He was a karate instructor. The only thing you could tell, it was, the only lasting damage was that he, he, what did I say, he lost the left side of his brain, right? He did not have a peripheral vision on his right eye. Everything was fine. I'm helping him study for a, a test. He wanted to become a, he was a second degree boiler engineer. He wanted to become a first degree boiler engineer. He said to me, I know this. I can't write anymore. I said, what are you talking about? To me, right all the time. He said, no, I draw the letters. You know, I can tell the difference. But basically, he said, how can that be? I once asked the guy who explained this to me. So would you tell a physician who has minor damage, just damage the whole side of the brain, you, better, you get better recovery from massive damage than from small damage. Brain circuitry. You might say, oh, you have damage in this part of the brain, so this doesn't work in this part of the brain. So that's hooey. Brain circuitry. There's a myelin my, myelination here. Let's go over here. Let's go to the... It's either pronounced myelinization or myelination. It's the sheathing, I believe, of the dendrites of the brain. It's... Am I... Somebody's going... You, you study this stuff? Huh? Yeah, take a clear. It's the sheathing, I think, of the dendrites in the brain. And it, it's usually when formal operational thinking comes, that's when it comes, adult thinking comes, you see that. Interestingly enough, most people think, well, let's take a little vote here. You have massive brain damage that damage to the whole side of the brain. Who's going to recover better, a 5-year-old, a 15-year-old, or a 55-year-old? Or Who votes for the 5-year-old? Who votes for the 15-year-old? Who votes for the 55-year-old? Why did you vote for the 15-year-old? That's the right answer. Why? Yeah, why? Why'd you vote for the 15 year old? Tell me if it's just a gut instinct, it's probably the right one. I just think that they've experienced something in life and they can go from there. Yeah, that's pretty close. That's pretty close. Why did you say the 15 year old? 
I don't know. <laughs> it just seemed like a time when their brain is like. I think I read that or learned that the brain is still the brain is what? adolescence. The brain is flexible. That's exactly right. That's why a 15 year old has a much better chance than a 55 year old. Because the circuits are not so ingrained. And you can develop new circuits on the other side of the brain. But why better than a five year old? Push it down. I just thought that. You know, five-year-old, their brain might not be as hard or as developed. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Right? So we had the two ends, right? One is that the other side is the 15-year-old's other side of the brain is myel myelinated already. It's there. It's working. The five-year-old has to develop the whole brain through these damaged circuits. Interesting enough, if they, if you, there are, have been people born with only half a brain. Nobody knew it until they took an x-ray. They're fine. They take newborn apes, take out half their brain, they develop normally. I know, you're not supposed to do that. It's not nice. Look at the looks I'm getting. But they develop normally. They're OK. OK. Furthermore, the development of the brain requires interaction with the environment. If you take a monkey, they did this, lock it up in a dark room from birth, so it never sees light, you know, double door, so you, before you go, play with it, feed it, do anything. After a certain time, a certain amount of time, the monkey will be permanently blind. Permanently blind. Even if you take it out into the light, after a certain amount of time, it can never learn to see. And after the monkey dies from old age, now you, what is it, you sacrifice the monkey for science. I don't know if we could do this stuff anymore. You do a, uh, does anybody know this word? Here, I'm going to teach you a new word. Come to the, what do you call it? Anybody know that word? A necropsy? That's an autopsy on an animal. You don't do autopsies. Autopsies on people. You do a necropsy, come back to me. The monkey has abnormal brain development. Luria told us this a million years ago. I'll tell you how good a psychologist Luria was. He was so famous and so well known that even Stalin had to let him say what he thought. That's well known. Everyone else had to pretend he was a Pavlovian psychologist. Luria told us, right, he was probably the most famous Soviet psychologist there was. That development requires interaction with the environment, and that's what Piaget said too. Development requires interaction. But Piaget knew, let's go back to so something I can finish this. That, I mean, the brain is a very good. Oh, there's a wire loose in your brain. Give me a break, will you please? This is only one of the mechanisms of accommodation. Piaget stages are not only maturational. Development through the stages requires interaction with the environment. That's all I want to say. Come back to me. Piaget once had a discussion with a woman who was an infant school teacher in England, which is basically kindergarten. And she said to him, Mr. Piaget, my children can do what you think it takes f formal operational reasoning to do. They're five years old, six years old. Instead of saying, look, what you're doing is probably having them memorize tasks and they're thinking, he said, that may very well be, madam. All I'm saying is they went through all the other stages first. They went through my sequence of development. Okay? So that's downplaying maturation, obviously, right? So what Piaget is saying, look, the brain, there obviously is something. You know my relationship, but there's somebody who wrote a book trying to put Piaget stages of development together with with um, with brain maturation, right, and looking myelinization, all this, and this is—he wasn't one of our doctoral students, but he had a master's degree in physiology and physiological, some or other. He taught me whatever I know about the brain. He taught me, right? It was very little, <laughs> not on the fly. He said to me, you know, he said, don't bother to read it. It's no good. It doesn't work. It's very difficult to do. And there is development of the brain well past formal operations, the twenties and the thirties, right? So Pia, but Piaget understood that there was something to it. But basically, he's telling you to get development of the brain, to get development through the stages, to get people's thinking to change, there has to be interaction with the environment, with the physical and the social environment. And education needs to mean exploring the environment. If the article that you were assigned, or should have been assigned, by Duckworth, right, reading Piaget's, when he, he, she throws him a softball, right? She basically says, okay, tell me about other, she gives him a chance to take a pot shot at any other educational system, and he takes a crack at Montessori. 
who was probably the system closest to his. And what's his gripe? It's a lockstep. Montessori says, here you have sticks, and this step is to put them from the shortest to the longest. He said, what are you talking about? Let the kid play with the sticks. Let the kid put one long, one short, one long. Let him fan them out. Let her, sorry, let her fan them out. Let her do this, let her do that. Let the kids explore. Be creative, see what's going on. And most of us know that we consider the, 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 the truly gifted kid, the one who's the most, is not the one who goes and weighs the scale, uses the scale, I think I used this already, to the nearest millionth of an ounce, but it's one who takes about the scale and see how it's working. Off task! But for Piaget, that's the best thing. Creativity, understanding, reasoning and logic. He doesn't care what your answer is. I'll tell you a reason. I'll give you one more example. I had a, I had a, a, a physicist I worked with years ago. He's going to show me. I had two balls. Put them on his scale. We weigh them. I said they weigh the same. And this went down to like the hundredth of a gram. It took me 15 minutes to get them weigh the same. I said, he said, okay, I agree. Within, within the range of accuracy of this scale. I said, can you say they weigh the same? I said, okay. Right? I said, now watch me. I took them off and I mashed them down into a pancake. I said, and I went like this. So they still weigh the same? He said, oh, I don't think so. I didn't care what his answer was. I said, why not? He said, well, he said, on every mass, there are free floating electrons. So when you went like this, you almost certainly knocked off free floating electrons. Electrons don't have any weight. They're the smallest mass. They weigh, if I say that they weigh 100 billion trillion zillionth of a gram, I'm overestimating their weight, right? But they have something, some mass. He said, so at that level, this ball that you didn't bang weighs less than because you didn't knock off as many free floating electrons. Think I cared? That's a formal operational answer. It doesn't matter what his answer is. He's trying to be a wise guy because he's so used to saying, oh, the answer tells you. I said, perfect, formal operational. I had to believe him, but <laughs> you know, it's a, I, at that time, I, yeah, that's why. I, so that's the key, thinking, 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 thinking. Not how much you know, but how you know. Not memorizing, but thinking. And learning, not learn this skill, learn that skill. How many times are you told, learn it, it'll be good for you later? No. You learn to read, not by, you learn to read because there's a problem you have that you need to read to do. You learn math because there's a problem you have, you need to have math to do, right? You want to draw a picture? That's how you learn line and form and content, because there's a picture you want to draw. Once I saw a garble of colors, and I asked an artist, I was with an artist, and the first artist said to me, he said, that's, that's not abstract expressions, that's a bunch of junk. So I asked another artist, do you like that picture? The guy, I found out that the restaurant owner's niece had drawn it. He said, oh my God, now while we're eating. I said, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? And here I am, I'm not an artist. He goes, bah, bah, bah. he said, finally he gets frustrated to look and he puts his hand in fist, he says, it doesn't make sense. Not, oh, it doesn't have this skill and that skill. It doesn't make sense. There's no message to it. Art is sense. Art is not just, it's not just a slobbering of colors for abstract expressionism. Hans Hoffman and Jackson Pollock were doing things that made sense. Sense, sense, sense. There's a problem to solve. There's something to do. And that is the key. Okay, next week, we're going to talk about stages, Piaget's stages, and how these stages work, and we're going to see what goes through the, and the thinking at each stage, and how each new stage solves problems you couldn't solve in the previous stage, why it's a higher, more adaptive level, and we'll uh, go from there. See you next week. Thank you.